Dear friends, welcome to Peace Education and the Pandemic, Global Perspectives. This special uh, webinar has been uh, co-organized by the International Institute on Peace Education and the Global Campaign for Peace Education. My, we've been really thrilled again by the overwhelming response to this webinar. More than uh, as of this morning, about 550 people have registered from at least 72 different countries from around the world. And uh, I mean, obviously that's pretty remarkable. It shows that um, peace educators are resilient. We're hungry for being in community together, for learning how uh, we're each approaching this uh, corona crisis in different ways in our different contexts around the world. Um, you know, we regret that we can't accommodate everyone here on the Zoom call this morning. But again, this session is being recorded and it will be made uh, available for later viewing via the Global Campaign for Peace Education website. So you'll be able to find it there. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Tony Jenkins. I'm the Managing Director of the International Institute on Peace Education and the Coordinator of the Global Campaign for Peace Education. Uh, and I'll just simply be your host today. Um, also just kind of contributing a few things here as we begin. Um, a little bit about today's session. We have uh, 12 featured uh, invited speakers who will be sharing with us. Um, and we're gonna open it up after we hear from them to others to share some of their own perspectives uh, and to ask questions uh, of our guests. Um, our invited speakers are, are coming from or are working in 11 different country contexts. Many of them are also working internationally. So we do have quite a diversity of perspectives and concerns reflected in the experiences that they're going to share today. So we thought of this, this, this webinar for me, I think covers two kind of broad um, frameworks. Um, on one hand, we see this webinar as uh, an important opportunity to hear how peace educators from around the world are you know responding in this moment you know how um how have our you know curricula agendas changed as a result of covid 19. Um, how are peace educators you know facilitating the much needed learning that's required for things like self-care resilience and, and and adaptation to the changing reality that we're in how are we adapting pedagogically you know, to these new online learning spaces, to Zoom? And I, I saw in the chat that a number of you have never been on Zoom before, so welcome for your first time. Um, but also shifting to this new technology is also revealing a lot of educational inequity uh, and other issues of social injustice that we haven't thought about before as we kind of work through these really rapid transitions. How are we kind of dealing with, you know, keeping, you know, quote unquote, safe physical distance while also trying to find ways to maintain social connections. How are we as peace educators navigating the trauma, the anxiety and the fear that's caused by the pandemic and what it's revealing, um, particularly at a kind of a physical vulnerability level, but also at the, the vulnerability of our social, political and economic systems. How are we, how are we dealing with that? So that's the one aspect of it. So what's peace education doing in the moment? But on the other hand, this webinar is also really uh, an important opportunity for us to collectively rethink some of the urgent agendas that we have for peace education. Um, as we shared in the appeal to in the invitation to join us for this webinar today, uh, this global pandemic has brought into really sharp focus many of the concerns and possibilities and challenges um, that peace education has been pursuing for decades. So in a way, it's shining a light on those things for us and there's an opportunity for us to rebuild those agendas. You know, for, for starters, um, how might we begin shifting from kind of a national security um, to a human security paradigm? And what's the role of peace education in that? All right, so the world's military might is obviously very useless against this little invisible virus that we're, we're dealing with. And if we wisely began to divert a tiny percent of glo uh, global military expenditures, um, <clears throat> to, to meet human needs, we might be in a very different position than we are today to assure the security and well-being of the people on the planet. To dive a bit more deeply, how can the prevailing mindsets of patriarchy, of militarism, nationalism, and neoliberalism, these kinds of ethos of our, most of our political leaders, um, with all their tough bravado, um, how do these mindsets keep us from threat and assure human well-being and flourishing? Uh, when these ways of thinking have so evidently failed to keep us secure from this sort of microscopic foe that we're all dealing with right now. 
So this past week, um, to kind of wrap up here, the global campaign began a new series uh, of articles and posts and guided inquiries that we're calling Corona Connections, learning for a renewed world. And we see in a way that this webinar is a complement to that. Our goal through that series and through today is to explore how the COVID-19 pandemic relates to these other peace education issues. Uh, and I hope if you have a chance to visit our site today, our most recent article, um, which was authored this weekend by Betty Reardon, examines the interrelationship between the causes, characteristics, and potential consequences of the threats posed by nuclear weapons and global pandemics. So we need to make these connections, all right, to be able to envision new security paradigms. And we need to continue to educate, to nurture the political efficacy that's necessary to challenge the old systems and to design new, more preferred ones that are more rooted in kind of principles and the dynamics of a culture of peace. So I hope uh, in today's conversation uh, is going to spark some, some new uh, Corona connections. Uh, and I actually I actively in, in encourage and invite all, everyone who's on the call today to consider reaching out to us if you might be interested in contributing something to our ongoing series. So quickly, here's how today's uh, webinar is gonna work. Um, I'm gonna quickly introduce uh, each of our invited uh, speakers one at a time, and we will be following the order that is listed on the event website. Um, and uh, I'm just gonna say a word or two about each, each of our amazing guests, where they're working, some of the issues they're working on. And then each speaker is going to have a maximum of five minutes to share. And I know that's not very much time, um, especially when we really get to see each other. Uh, but we have an hour and a half today, and if we give you much more time than that, we won't have a chance to hear from others as well. So please, uh, please no more than five minutes. Um, and after we hear from our invited guests, I'm going to open it up uh, to others to, to share briefly um, some of the, the adaptations that they're doing and dealing with the concerns, the agendas they have, the questions they might have. And when I do so, I'm going to just uh, kindly request so we can hear from as many as possible that you keep your, your comments to a minute or two at most. Um, and so once again, uh, now that we're going to turn our attention to our invited guests, I'm going to invite everyone to be sure to, to remain, remain muted um, throughout the rest of the program until we open it up. Um, and to please, unless you're one of our speakers, to turn off your video just to save a little bit on the bandwidth. Uh, and when we get to the q and I'll give you a few more instructions uh, as well. So um, I'd like to get us started um, by inviting our dear friend from Austria, Werner Winterstreiner. Um, to share a little bit about um, how, what Corona is showing us in terms of the state of the world. Um, so uh, Werner Wintersteiner is a retired professor from Klagenfurt University in Austria. Um, and from 2005 to 2016, he was the founding director of the Center for Peace Research and Peace Education there. Um, you can read more about his, his uh, bio online. Um, but one of the areas um, of, of work that he does is particularly relevant for our discussion today is around global citizenship education. So I want to go ahead and turn it over to Werner. Good afternoon, everybody from Austria, because we have afternoon now. First of all, I would like to thank you, Tony, for this excellent idea and for organizing this. I'm really very grateful and I think this is very important. Thank you, Tony, and thank you to the whole team. So my question is, uh, or my, my issue is uh, 10 lessons from Corona. But uh, when I say lessons from Corona, I do not mean that a Corona crisis is a teacher. A crisis is never a teacher. Uh, it doesn't teach us anything, but we can draw uh, lessons from it. And we absolutely have to do this. We cannot afford any longer not to learn from crisis. And of course, my 10 points will be 10 points from a European standpoint, and even an Austrian one maybe, but you can now compare if you have made the same conclusion or other ones. I will be very short, of course, because I have only five minutes. First point is, Corona confronts us with our own behavior. Like the doctors have to study uh, the virus, we have to study our own uh, behavior in times of crisis. Some uh, researchers have found out that uh, there are some typical unproductive patterns of behavior in such a situation. First, denial, then fear, then moralizing, 
and the blaming others, and finally an action at any price. Uh, we should um, be very aware which of these uh, uh, behaviors we have in, my, in your country, in my country, and what we can maybe change uh, in order to find better ways uh, to cope with this situation. Second point, Corona shows us the state of the world. We have created all kinds of globalization, economical, cultural, and so on. But we, what is still missing is um, a globalization of solidarity. We have created global problems, but we have not created structures and means for global solidarity. In my country, and I'm sure also in your country, I see a lot of uh, helpful people, a lot of solidarity, uh, a lot of uh, really nice uh, stories, but uh, as long as there are no structures for transnational cooperation, there is no uh, transnational uh, solidarity, and even uh, those, uh, this solidarity that we find is in the trap of nationalism. I think this is uh, a very important thing, and we must understand that we are earthly community of destiny, as Edgar Morin has put it uh, 30 years ago, and it's even more now. My third point, it's especially for Europeans, we must become Europeans out of national interest. Uh, Europeans have um, reacted as any state in, in other countries, they have only looked at the save yourself who can methodology. But uh, Europe is a union and we do not see any more union. So we have to learn to become a European again. Uh, and uh, I think this is very important. And in a similar way, we need a global solidarity. Number four, it's also very, I guess, typically for Western countries. Uh, we see that our imperial mode of living creates or favors crisis and pandemics. This is uh, not only a lesson from Corona, it's also a lesson from climate crisis, from the so-called refugee crisis, and now again, we are living uh, at the expense of people in other regions and at the expense of uh, future generations, including our own one. Uh, and I think uh, we ha really have to think our way of life and our specific way of globalization. We need another kind of globalization. Some people say now we do not need any more globalization. I don't believe it. I believe we uh, need another one, a more solidary one. Yeah. This is number four. Number five, we cannot longer afford the prevailing culture of war. Um, this is also a very important thing. Tony has mentioned it at the very beginning, especially nuclear arms in France. They have uh, made a, a table uh, showing that only with um, improving the nuclear arms, uh, they could uh, master the whole uh, medical crisis. All this money is spent for this. So, and we don't have to forget that uh, Nuclear weapons and all uh, weapons of mass destruction is uh, an essential resource of or essential tool for the climate a reason for the climate crisis and uh, for insecurity on in the world. So we cannot anymore afford this culture of war that supports this arms race that we have. Number six, we have uh, for the first time, I think, uh, for many years seen uh, that uh, politics is capable of achieving a majority without demagogic populism. And this is only true because uh, people are more politicized than before, are more looking for true news instead of fake news. I'm very sure with this one. Number seven, human security needs a social net and a welfare state. Uh, the, a neoliberal ideology always wanted us to uh, explains that uh, uh, well, human security is not necessary, social nets are not necessary, uh, it's uh, a small state uh, uh, 
uh, slim state is uh, the ideal. Now we see exactly the contrary. Number eight, uh, the nationalistic reflex can be overcome, but only if we create in time without crisis transnational structures of solidarity. For instance, um, uh, the World Health Organization should be strengthened. For instance, the UN should be reformed, and so many other things. I cannot uh, continue in this, I have not much time. Number nine, we have to learn to live with the virus. COVID-19 uh, virus has come to stay. Uh, and uh, I think we have to cope with it and we have uh, to, to reflect in which way we can live so that we can manage this crisis and so many other crises that are a, a, a part of uh, human existence and human experience. And maybe the most important lesson is number 10. We must learn to see ourselves not as masters of the creation, but of at least co-pilots of the earth, as Ed Morin has put it again. Yeah? This means uh, we believe that we can subdue the earth, we can master the nature, but now we see we are only a part of the nature. And we have to uh, to change our whole way of living in order to this new and uh, not so new experience. Uh, so I think I'm my 10 uh, points. Thank you so much. Thank you, Werner. That was a, a really remarkable and holistic uh, introduction. I hope um, you have some wonderful notes you can share with us. Uh, we'd love to publish those your 10 lessons in our Corona Connections series. Uh, I want to uh, now transition to uh, our, our good colleague, Anita Yudkin from Puerto Rico. Uh, Anita is the coordinator of the UNESCO Chair on Education for Peace uh, and a professor of educational foundations there. Um, her work um, has uh, focused around critical and transformative pedagogies, children's rights and human rights and peace education. And Anita's going to, I think, make some good connections with some of um, Werner's wonderful points. And she's going to explore for us how this pandemia is making evident and, uh, and worsens the human rights situations, especially those uh, strained by undemocratic policies and colonial and the colonial status of Puerto Rico. So, Anita. Hello, everybody. Um, well, uh, a couple of years ago, a much esteemed uh, colleague, professor of law, Efren Rivera, wrote an article about the status of human rights in Puerto Rico, and he said, there are two overarching themes that you always need to consider when talking about human rights and thus peace in Puerto Rico, and that's uh, the two overarching themes of colonialism and poverty. Because of these two harsh realities, the way we live an experience like this pandemia is quite uh, particular and at the same time challenging. If, if you add to those two characteristics that fast forward to 2020, we've had a collapse of the government and public services, especially health and education due to an economic and political crisis, the privatizing of these services not seen as human rights, but as commercial services, and also government corruption, which has tended to obscure everything else along the way and go along the line that Werner was mentioning of you know, the survival of the fittest or anybody who can go ahead and find a way to survive. Um, we add to this the devastation caused by Hurricane Maria in 2017, which we haven't recovered from and uh, lost many of the already functioning uh, remaining health services as cause of that devastation. Well, that's the backdrop with which we face um, the COVID um, virus. And so far, the main measure has been a lockdown and a police enforced curfew, which 
was early enough. I, um, this is the fourth week or the fifth week we are facing these measures. And so far it has resulted in a small number of contagious uh, um, people that have been diagnosed and also of deaths. But this is a very limited uh, number of tests that have been performed. So the major problem has been that the only measure has been the lockdown. There haven't really been thorough testing or public health measures taken for the benefit of the general public. And there's a lack of tracing of cases. So during Maria, we learned to take care of ourselves and not you know, wait for the government to do something about it. But this is a very different scenario where we really need major tools than, than the solidarity action that allowed us to survive after the hurricane. Um, and so you would say, well, ha what does colonialism and poverty have to do with this scenario that I just mentioned? Well, a lot, and I'll just give just very brief examples. We have a complete, practically over 90% of our food is important, imported. So we don't have local food production that can help us nearly um, attain enough food under any circumstance like this, which means you have, anyway, it's complicated. And um, for example, we also have no control of our airport. So right now there's many flights coming in from the US mainly, although some international flights have been stopped, and, and especially from the states where there's more con um, people that, ha that are sick. Uh, also, the poverty issue well means that this has a very unequal impact on those of us who are living with the conditions imposed by the curfew and the disease. Um, I just want to give one more example of something that has happened to mention some ideas that I think are crucial for peace education in our case. After much criticism and questioning of the government uh, strategy, the governor canceled her press conference this weekend and instead she used a special program in which she was there with a medical task force she has called in in order to I guess it provides some uh, scientific basis to what she's doing, although some of the measures taken by the task force has been questioned. Well, she was there with the uh, members of the task force and private business representative. Uh, and there was no press and it was just an informative um, uh, public relations conference with a mask in which she integrated the governor's uh, coat of arms into the mask. It was a whole um, montage in order for her to say that everything's under control, which it isn't. And many organizations have been claiming that a social task force should also be um, appointed so that many other issues other than just uh, business interest or exclusively medical issues are attended to. So what would be some lessons for peace education uh, from this scenario. I believe we all need tools to understand the complexity of what a global pandemia is and all the consequences that this has for people's daily lives. But we need to understand it from multiple disciplines and, and in a very comprehensive way. We also need to make sure we, we carry through and we enforce and we talk about certain key values and principles of human rights and peace education, which is the value of human dignity and non-discrimination, which isn't being considered under the way this is being um, treated. Also, the importance of uh, the knowledge of human security issues, which Werner brought before, instead of a military or police view of security, which has been very uh, present in Puerto Rico. We have more people detained for violating the curfew than people who have been found positive with the virus, because that's been the main enforcing tool is making people stay at home, which I understand it's important and it's necessary. 
but the priority has become the enforcing of that principle instead of attending to the real problem of the pandemia. And uh, also we need to understand also um, forms of autonomous generating of energy and food, which we already knew were needed due to the hurricane in 2017. And most of all, I think we need to work on some critical media literacy and, and critical thinking of what we're being told and what we're not being told of what is happening around us in regards of this pandemia and in regards of how the world is managing or mismanaging in some cases, the response to the virus. Thank you, Anita. Um, that was really marvelous uh, and a really wonderful transition from Werner's 10 points to yours, um, revealing this tension between colonialism, neoliberalism, in human rights, the way it's manifested itself in terms of food, food insecurity, um, the challenges of self-determination, um, and the call for localizing our economies. I think these are really important points. I want to transition now to another perspective that I think will, will, will give us a, another lens for looking at human rights. I want to invite Bernadette Mutan from South Africa. Bernadette is an activist, a poet, an educator, um, her life's work has been directed towards increasing access to basic social institutions that have long excluded women, in particular women of color in South Africa, and she's the co-founder and director of the NGO Engender. Bernadette, and if I can please ask everyone to, I know this is really difficult, and, uh, and, I, and I, uh, I'm responsible for this too, but please speakers, please try to set yourself a stopwatch and, and limit to five minutes, otherwise we're going to run out of time for everyone to be able to share. Bernadette. Thank you, Tony. If I speak too fast, just flag it for me, but I have only five minutes, so I want to race through it. I want to start by talking about South Africa's democracy, which is based on a constitution founded on intersectionalities, which really is just the coming together of all forms of identities, areas for prejudice and a privilege. Um, in its um, equality clause, our constitution uh, prohibits discrimination on an unprecedented six Steam, which includes sex, pregnancy, marital states, and so on. And uh, the Constitution's emphatic that no person, I'm quoting, may unfairly discriminate directly or indirectly against anyone on one or more of these 16 grounds. The preamble of the Constitution, all this is very important background for how we're dealing with a pandemic. The preamble says, healing the divisions of the past and establishing a society based on democratic values, social justice, fundamental human rights, and then it speaks of within a family of nations. It speaks of a compassionate society coming out of our and passionate world. Uh, we have a coat of arms and a motto uh, rooted in indigenous um, knowledge, uh, speaking of unity in diversity or diverse people united. Of a constitution is the supreme law of the, the country. Uh, it, we have a deliberately diverse society with a deliberately secular state. Throughout the curricula in our schools and throughout our society, we've mainstreamed these constitutional values and our Bill of Rights with these 16 grounds of non-discrimination. This is the foundations of our democracy, values, peace and justice. The constitution is supported by various institutions truly, uh, which support democracy. These include, for example, the Human Rights Commission and the Commission for Gender Equality. But the, our communities comprise uh, diverse people. Many of these communities in uh, South Africa are deeply patriarchal. Many of them wrestle with the legacies of 300 years of brutal colonialism, genocide and slavery and 50 years of even worse apartheid, in which not only our people were destroyed, this almost destroyed as well. This resulted in a lot of insecurities which manifest in a number of particular ways, both for individuals, uh, but also for institutions. And these institutions have patriarchy predominating. This is especially true for much of the security cluster like the military and the police. So while the president and many of the cabinet and other leaders have been really exemplary in maturity and compassion, 
during this pandemic, the security cluster leaders have deployed the language of war, turning citizens just routinely deploying violence when warnings would suffice and beating at least one, two human beings to death in the confines of their front yards. Even racism is deployed against indigenous people, for example, people called colored under apartheid, who look like me, with a major city mayor, the head of a city, caught on video encouraging security officers to employ violence against what, what he called bush Men. This man is a black man, but he has no political consciousness. And all anti-apartheid activists, even I as a child under apartheid, we were inculcated with a broad, inclusive black consciousness and pan-Africanism, which many of these people, like this mayor, is not familiar with. Um, these apolitical, patriarchal peoples are our worst enemies um, if we must deploy othering, uh, ironically as a society. Gender violence of the public with vulnerable families has skyrocketed. With this increased militarism, bullying of media and community leaders, elements of violence and tyranny by some in the security cluster, we need even more courage as a society to be aware, to be resilient, to develop alternatives that draw on our historic interdependencies. We already have all the language, the laws, the tools. Whether and how we use these formidable resources is a challenge. We on a step between patriarchy and its attendant violences and oppressions in some cultures and traditions, which directly contradict constitutional gender and other equalities. These are hangovers from apartheid now being abused by entrepreneurial criminals against our own people. We're too silent on over 70% Christians, some of whom wish to impose the Old Testament onto the rest of us, including male supremacy and female subordination against LGBTQI peoples. This isn't entirely unlike Atwood, Margaret Atwood's iconic The Handmaid's Tale. But unlike the US, South Africa has constitutional rights to non-discrimination, which outweigh so-called free speech. Racist, sexist, and homophobic speech are outlawed in South Africa. People go to prison if they are racist in public. Yet it is only anti-racism that we are obsessed with as a society. We neglect with, it, with its violences, which are spouted from pulpits and boardrooms, and also people are made much more vulnerable during this pandemic. We not only need high level political will, in the absence of our people being rescued from the leaders we elect and being bullied by a majority of people suffering of internalized oppression from centuries of depredations, we the people, we have civic action. Actions founded on consciousness, rooted in community networks. We are compassionately supporting especially the vulnerable people amongst us through these grassroots community action networks. It's this strangulation of consciousness or mindsets or awareness with compassion and with justice that's helping our local communities through the pandemic and that will sustain us in co-creating a more humane, a non-violent world. Now more than ever, we have nothing to lose and every thing to gain. That's it. Remarkable. Unless you want a poem. Oh, we could we could go on for hours, but that will be the next webinar. We'll have to have one on ones with everyone here. Obviously, five minutes is just unjust. But thank you, Bernadette, for revealing the the important lenses of patriarchy and structural racism that are sort of masking these quote unquote compassionate responses and putting forth the call for intersectionality, gender justice, courage civic action, and most importantly, the need to respond with both compassion and justice. I want to now turn it over to one of my longtime co-conspirators from the United States, very much a global citizen, Janet Gerson. She is the Education Director of the International Institute on Peace Education, a political theorist, a peace educator, and many other 
uh, roles too, too long to list here in this short introduction. And Janet's gonna talk to us about, um, well, her title is, It Takes a Virus, The Political Implications of Our Interdependence. Janet. Hello. <clears throat> Thank you. I see we unmute ourselves for the next speaker to know. First of all, <clears throat> I, want, I want to welcome all of you. I'm so completely delighted to be with you because most of the time I, I am sequestered and masked because all around me people are dying at the rate of about between seven and 800 per 24 hour period. We're in the midst of a very serious pandemic in what was often considered one of the most sophisticated and wealthy and uh, cities in the world with the most uh, convergence of capacities to deal with things like this. Okay, I want to point out that this, this webinar is a, a model prefigurative of the global structures which Werner was mentioning. Many of us here, many of the speakers and others too, have been for at least 20 years part of the global campaign for peace education, which has proved itself to be a resilient network demonstrating the value of social coordination and communication among people who have local knowledge and who can communicate and share across all kinds of uh, uh, divisions as Bernadette was managing, it was mentioning uh, gender and race and class and uh, intersectionalities of all kinds. We have been working on that for at least 20 years and our resilience comes uh, from individuals each taking a part. So therefore I point out that that is one of the capacities we need to educate for the values of interconnectedness and interdependence, the basic value of human dignity and, um, and dignity of the environment and the earth that we live in. I point out in the uh, tradition of Betty Reardon that we look at our differences as complementarities and we consider the function and the basis of institutions and institutional relationships for a globalized, safe, and healthy world, and ecologically safe, to be based on coordination and valuing of multiple sets of overlapping and interconnected relationships. Let me take, uh, give you two metaphors. Metaphors being a pedagogical tool a poetic comparison to describe what, how things have been made visible by this virus. It takes a virus to make structural violence and structural issues is the top, my topic. The first metaphor is that I am here in a boat, a nice little rowboat, also known as my apartment, where I've been working from home with technology for uh, 10 years. I am in a boat in the choppy waters of New York City, where many of my neighbors are from the Dominican Republic, for example. They're immigrants. Some of them are citizens, but they are also supporting family members. Many of the family members may be living with them. So whereas I live currently only with my husband, people near me may have as many as seven or 10 people in a small apartment. They are also the workers 
who are here. Some of them are citizens and in the same family. Some are uh, um, residents and some have no legal status at all. So they're basically in hiding. Yet these are the people working in the supermarkets, working in, uh, uh, as ambulance drivers, working in the hospitals. And therefore we are all intimately in touch and intimately connected. Therefore our interdependence and dealing with this virus depends on equality of all of us, all of us, all of us can get a virus. At the same time, while I'm in my little apartment feeling safe and able to work, they're in the choppy waters like many refugees we read about in the Mediterranean, without boats, many of them, without life rafts. These, let us put one more level to this, which is the heaving earth of existential existence under which all of this choppy water is coming from. The healthcare workers who in New York City, in this city of great wealth, have no insufficient protective equipment to save their own lives. At the same time, these people, these great souls are working to save the lives of everyone they can. Okay, and by the way, there's no testing in New York City except as triage. You have to be deathly sick to get the test unless you are, you know, some famous rich person. So only information we have is coming from the people about to die in triage. Okay, my second metaphor, as I'm running out of time, is termites. <laughs> termites are insects that eat wood. In the United States and maybe many other places, the basic infrastructure of a building, a house, is wood. The termites are invisible. They chomp away and eat out the infrastructure. This is my metaphor for neoliberalism and this 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 virus has made the visible how, for example, neoliberalism has eaten out the medical care of our society so that medicine and hospitals are primarily for-profit organizations. And we can see that they're collapsing under the weight. And of this uh, pressure of the pandemic. And our political leaders who are buying for profit out of the products that should be made from this pandemic, like tests, vaccines, uh, protective equipment, our respirators, are distributing unevenly. For example, New York City with the global hotspot of the world is getting a whole significantly less funding and backing up than Nebraska, where it's really not obvious yet because we are a democratic and not a Republican voting state. Okay, and finally, I want to say that the role of government should be mediator, facilitator, and distributive manager of the public good. The public good is what we need to be practicing to survive this pandemic for people and for the future work of climate, which we haven't been able to mobilize for. And um, this public should be understood beyond the idea of just the people versus the government. We must include all sectors, business, uh, uh, health, et cetera, et cetera. I won't name them uh, because we all are doing that. In relationships of complementarity, cooperation, and coordination for the public good, we can practice this in, as peace educators in all of the settings. Scientists around the world are ahead of us in coordinating that and looking for 
solutions to this virus, we should be grateful and, mo and modeling them. Thank you very much. Thank you, Janet. Um, two interesting metaphors, boats and termites, probably shouldn't go too well together. Um, thank you for, for bringing up the, uh, those metaphors as tools. Thank you for actually where, where you began by uh, addressing how the, the Global Campaign for Peace, Education, and Network has been modeling a form of prefigurative politics for a long time. And really that puts forth a call for peace education in general to be educating for forms of prefigure politics as well. Um, so just a, another quick reminder to all of our coming speakers, um, please, everyone's been going almost twice as long and we're really gonna run out of time. So please set yourself a stopwatch and help me out. Um, I don't really wanna stop these remarkable uh, conversations, but I wanna make sure we also have a chance to hear from others as well. So now I wanna uh, turn our attention to uh, our wonderful guest, Rosie Chawla, who is going to be joining us today from China. Uh, Rosie has a really remarkable background, a master's degree in conflict resolution and negotiations from Columbia University, uh, a, a business postgraduate certificate from the Wharton Business School. Um, she's currently in China um, and working on global, as a global projects advisor where she is developing educational projects on peace and conflict through global issues. Uh, and she's going to share with us a little bit about some of the ways in which the epidemic is revealing opportunities to, to discuss issues of equality, vulnerability, and identity in China. Rosie. Um, hi, everyone. I just want to say first hi to all my IIPE friends. I just saw you all not too long ago. Um, and I welcome all of our guests from all over the world joining us. Um, Yes, I have been working in China in the last three and a half years. Um, and as you know, that China is not a very, very open country. Um, it has been quite hard to expose a lot of the things that I've been able to do here, simply because it threatens the people and the organizations that are working with me or that are trying to work with me to develop new, new things. And this is because the reality in China is that, of course, you all know China is not a open democratic country where information is actually possible to be released that would be highly accurate. So we always want to keep in mind about people working in China and what they are doing in China and how much are they really able to talk about it in a very safe way if they are planning to continue to work in China like I am. So what I will start to say within five minutes is that um, everything started here in Wuhan with the epidemic. China has been in lockdown um, now going to 77 days in lockdown uh, in social distancing and isolation. Schools are still not open. Universities are still not operating. Everything is still online. Many, many businesses are still not allowed to open. I will say the economic impact in China from a political analyst that studies China so far has been that 400,000 businesses have closed because of this virus and, and about 10 million cell phone contracts were canceled. And this is all reported by top three carrier providers in China. So as you could see, the economic impact in China was big. And was China ready for this epidemic? No, not in the supply size. They were not as ready as United States is right now. Um, but here's what I will say when it comes to peace education so I don't run over my time. The, um, this, ep this epidemic has allowed in many, many spaces where it was hard before. I do wanna remind people that I don't work in, tra in traditional school structures. I build projects out locally on the ground all over China. And I bring local partners together with global partners. And we do that really, really carefully to reach isolated populations in, in China. So what I will say is that this epidemic actually created opportunities to humanize and discuss most sensitive issues in China. Because now suddenly, it, it, equality became very, very more important because if we kept suppressing the minorities as we've already done in China, there are 56 minorities still unrecognized 
if we do not offer health equity to them, if we do not reach out to our isolated populations, we will be in the global epidemic longer than China wants to be in. So this is just a little bit hint of how this epidemic has been able to humanize, humanize the way China does things, humanize the way we look at identity in China, and actually allow these conversations to take place on the world stage when we are making decisions as far as China goes. So I will end the introduction here because that would be five minutes. Um, Tony, please go ahead. <laughs> Rosie, you are so kind. Uh, thanks for modeling democracy uh, in our space where time is very limited. Um, and thanks for sharing um, this, some of these really important points about uh, the ways in which uh, the pandemic is revealing through the obvious interdependence and interconnections, the challenges of equity and equality and opening up that space to, to humanize those discourses in China. We wish you great luck with that. Uh, so now I want to shift to another global context um, and invite our, our friend and colleague Collins Emo from Nigeria. Um, Collins is the convener of the Nigeria Network and Campaign uh, for Peace Education. Um, he has a doctoral degree in education from the University of Toledo. And his areas of interest have been in social action, nonviolent movements, multicultural movements, sustainable development, diversity, and peace building. And he's going to uh, talk with us a little bit today about educating for peace in a frightened world. Collins. Yeah, thanks, Tony, for uh, this invitation. And thanks for all our friends from all over the world. It's an honor for me to be here today to discuss educating for peace in a frightened world. I'm in Nigeria, and there's a joke on the streets back home that the virus came of people that were infected were the big and mighty. You know, the rarity was that the index cases were those who were infected from abroad and they traveled to Nigeria and then bring the situation and, bring the, and brought the virus into the country. So now, you know, the big and mighty are the first, uh, you know, set of people who are infected. Currently, the country is in a lockdown. And because the country is in a lockdown, people are asked to stay at home. You know, and if you understand Nigeria and the economic situation back home, uh, we have about 70% of people who depend on going out every day to eke out a living. So if you ask people to stay at home and they don't go out to make their money, how are they going to survive? So these are the big challenges we face in the country where people have been locked down for the past two weeks and uh, people are trying to see how do we share solidarity? So I look at you know, educating for peace in a frightened world that our conception of peace is based on our worldview and rarity based on our encounters and our relationship. And of course, conflict are not caused by abstract human beings, they are caused by you know, we. And if we have to change the world, we have to change the way we think. And changing the way we think means we need to, be, you know, we need to endeavor at all time to make sure that we don't have conflict instead of trying to solve the conflict when it begins. You know, we have a saying that, you know, prevention is better than cure. So let's try to avoid the causes of conflict. Then looking at the COVID-19, you know, COVID-19 has no respect for whether you're a rich person or you're a poor person, you're a rich nation or, you know, you're a poor nation. If we look at what's happening to Spain, Italy, USA, you know, and then it shows clearly that COVID-19 respects, you know, nobody. So the question is this, you know, so is COVID-19 a leveler that levels the place, the whole world? You know, we activists, we look at, you know, a world where, you know, there's solidarity and peace and people tend to be equal. And then I ask myself, is COVID-19 actually creating that kind of world where there's no big person, there's no small person, there's no rich, there's no poor? But on deeper reflection, what I'm seeing is that COVID-19 has brought, you know, an atmosphere, a culture of fear. People are afraid. And again, you ask yourself, people are afraid. It's being afraid a negative uh, situation. Of course, being afraid can actually be, you know, in a situation for a preservation. But one thing of being afraid is that it can lead us to a situation where we're too scared and then we not start going into our selfish nation. So we're being, you know, we're selfish, we're egoistic, and they were not thinking about the common good. 
So in this situation of the pandemic, what we're noticing is that we're having a situation where people are thinking about their individual self. They're being selfish. And people are not looking at the big picture of solidarity, of world citizenship, which is what peace education is all about. So in that sense, how do we educate for peace in a frightened world? We have to go back to the basis where we look at what is peace education? And we're looking at peace education is not a generic tool. You educate for peace based on the circumstances, the people they need. Therefore, it's not a one cap that fits everybody. The way we're going to educate in New York might not be the same way we're going to educate in Lagos, Nigeria. But again, there's an embodiment of what peace education should encompass. In that sense, we have to tailor the need to what the for the people based on their specifics. We now look at you know, their age, the social status, the environment, and the various relationship within the people. So these are the things we need to look at when we try to educate for peace. And we need to understand, I want to understand that educating for peace you know, has a lot to do with how do we transform our values? How do we transform our attitude? How do we build the skills and behavior in order to live in harmony with ourselves, with others, and then with our natural environment, in order to reduce conflict, support transformation of conflict, and advance you know, the peace capability of both the individual group and society. So we need to facilitate a dialogue, a healthy dialogue, where people have to be able to come together and discuss, and reflect about the structural inequality based on local meaning and experience. The essence is that we need to discuss within our own context of what, you know, it, what meaning means to us. The essence is that this has to be a grassroots approach to enthrone social justice and human rights. In essence, we're not looking at one cap fits all. Each society in a frightening world need to look at their circumstances and start asking ourselves, how can we you know, educate ourselves to have solidarity and have compassion and be able to support each other. So for peace education to achieve this essence, one universal concept that, need, that bears in mind that we need to look at the issue of respect for human rights. When we're talking about the respect for human rights, we need to respect the person, irrespective of his sex, his origin, his status, or his belief system. We have to look at human being holistically because human rights is at the core of peace building. If we don't respect the dignity of humans, we can't be talking about you know, a peaceful society. Because of course, we know that conflict is necess it's a necessary part of life. Every people, when people meet together, there's bound to be misunderstanding, there's bound to be some element of conflict. But the key thing is that if we respect human rights, it will lead us to settling our differences without threats and violence. This is only possible when we start thinking about a shared humanity. In essence, we live in the same space. How do we protect the, and respect the vulnerable and others? And then this goes on to look at, by respecting the vulnerable and having compassion and building a global citizenship, then we'll be able to start you know, the transformation. The question now is, how then do we use this peace education in a frightened world? a world where people are scared. We now need to think about using the positive element of fear. Fear has its own negative element, which you know, we're seeing around in the whole world. The selfishness, you know, the lack of consideration for others, everybody thinking about themselves. Where, you know, there's so much story about negativism, about selfishness. It's about the negative conception of fear. But how do we start using the positive? The positive aspect of fear means how do we show solidarity? I would think, I would like to conclude this presentation by looking at, you know, educating for peace in a frightened world. How do we educate for peace? A majority concentrating on the allies. Look, I, I look at it this way, I'm an activist, so, you know, I look at it this way that is the allies that put up all the system and structures that dehumanize the people. And these are the, these are the issues that create violence. So how do we start educating the airlines to start understanding how the implications of their actions? 
So my proposal is that the learning should, we need to target the allies, they need to start understanding peace education. While we talk about peace education in the communities, in the school, we need to have a special emphasis on the allies because they make a lot of, um, they make a lot of policies that dehumanize people. So why communities should be involved you know, in imbibing on the citizens, global citizenship, we also need to look at the airlight. I'll end by quoting Betty Redden and Dale Snow in, 19, in 2014, when they stated the conscientization of the airlight may be the process upon which the future depends. In essence, educating for peace in a frightened world, we need to think about how do we change the way the airlights think? Can we start you know, enforcing a human rights education where the airlines start thinking differently and putting instructions that you know that brings in you know a release for the poor. Speaking for myself, a Nigerian, I'm looking at the situation in Nigeria where we're in a lockdown, but the majority of the people you know who are feeling the brunt has no means of sustenance. The rich folks can have a lot you know in their home, but the poor folks who are in lockdown don't even have physical distances or social distances. They live in what we call face me, I face you. So even if you say you're trying to provide, you know, prevent social and physical you know, distance, it's not going to happen. So at the end of the day, this policy is not breeds more conflict. In the streets of Lagos within the last few days, there have been pockets of, of crash where young people are going out in the street to demonstrate more like to loot things. But we need to start looking at a world where we'll have more peace by doing what? having more solidarity and the airlines putting out policies that are beneficial to everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you, Collins. Um, and thank you for reminding us of this tension um, that we need to mitigate between individualism as sort of a problem and social solidarity and bringing this emphasis of the importance of peace education and addressing the ways in which we think and peace education as seen as transformative education for both personal, personal and political change and transformation. Um, since you're addressing fear, I think our next speaker is gonna be a, a nice follow-up to you. Uh, I want to introduce Gail Galang um, from the Philippines. She is the Associate Director of the Center for Peace Education at Miriam College in Quezon City. Um, her expertise is particularly in psychology and education. <laughs> And she is also the chair of the Family Studies program there. And um, her university has recently put forward this great video series from Breakdown to Breakthrough. And she's going to provide us some insights and practical tips for building resilience during the COVID-19 pandemic. Gail. Hello, everyone. I'm speaking to you from Manila. And my presentation has three parts. So first, a brief description of the Philippine situation. Second, the resulting fear that has led into a collective and personal breakdown. And finally, the necessary steps in building inner resilience in order to achieve a breakthrough in preserving mental health. So first, the situation. As of 4 p.m. today, the Philippines has 4,932 cases of COVID-19. Out of these cases, 242 have recovered and 315 have died. In the ASEAN region, the Philippines ranks second to Malaysia in terms of having the most number of cases. The Philippine government placed the entire country on lockdown since March 17. We are now on day 28 of what we call the enhanced community quarantine. Now the collective breakdown. Our fatality rate of about 6.4% is higher than the global average. However, this is still an inaccurate figure given that we have very limited testing kits and a huge backlog on releasing test results. So the lack of government reassurance and the limitations of our healthcare services contribute to people's collective anxiety and grief. For instance, just a few days after the lockdown, the Philippine hospitals have sounded the alarm because personal protective equipment were running short, mortality was increasing, including a number of medical doctors who have succumbed to the virus. As early as week two, three big private hospitals were over their capacity and could no longer take in coronavirus patients. 
In the news today, a major government hospital plans to use container vans for preserving the remains of patients because it's more can only accommodate five corpses at a time. Again, on the collective breakdown to aggravate the fear, the government's response to the outbreak was too general and vague to offer any relief. This inadequate response has affected about 17.6 million Filipinos who live below the poverty threshold. Being on lockdown means no work, no pay, no food for them. Flashes of social unrest have already been reported. The awful truth was that aid was not reaching Filipinos fast enough. People are getting broke and hungry by the day and government has yet to communicate how to use the emergency funds it claims to have. Now for the personal breakdown. With a dark scenario like this, it is not a surprise that people are experiencing collective grief and despair. Psychologically, people are feeling anxious and vulnerable, fearful and depressed. Personally, we mourn the loss of many things just like you, our mobility, economic security, loss of connectedness, control, and peace of mind. Finally, the breakthrough. How do we convert the breakdown into a breakthrough? As a concrete action, Miriam College, under the Center for Peace Education, has put together a Families for Peace channel that aims to strengthen the positive well-being of families, especially during the pandemic. Specifically, the Breakdown to Breakthrough series aims to feature videos, resources by family studies experts, psychologists, psychiatrists, child and family advocates who provide practical tips that increase the competence of family members in dealing with crisis situations such as the pandemic. So as I close, let me share five practical tips that we all get from all these um, blogs on building resilience during the pandemic. Number one, acknowledge that we are in, the, in this situation right now, that things are not the same or might never be the same again. Thus, we have to rethink the way we do things, even how we should teach our students. Number two, honor and respect these feelings by expressing them in a healthy manner. Avoid distorted ways of thinking like blaming, having too many shoulds, Avoid overthinking and predicting a doomsday scenario. We are encouraged to live in the moment. Number three, it helps to practice gratitude by calling to mind what is still good and functioning. Number four, self-compassion by being kinder to ourselves during this period. We can do this by boosting our immune system, connecting to a friend, reading a book, learning a new skill or anything to nurture our physical, emotional, cognitive, social, and spiritual selves. Lastly, search for meaning. Reach out by giving support, and some have done this by launching campaigns to help medical and community frontliners. In the Philippines, which is a predominantly Catholic country, people have anchored themselves on God, especially in this season of Lent where people identify themselves with the suffering Christ, and just like Easter, hope for a resurrection from these dark times. We share these blogs to you, and it can be accessed through YouTube by simply searching MC Family Studies, MC for Miriam College, MC Family Studies on YouTube. This is our proactive response in promoting inner peace and positive mental health and family wellness. Thank you, and stay well, everyone. Mm. Thank you, Gail, for, uh, and your colleagues for developing this proactive response um, and helping us think about how we move from breakdown to breakthrough. These five tips are obviously invaluable. Uh, and for those um, who want, we've been also sharing these uh, videos as well on the Global Campaign for Peace Education, and you can find them there as, long, uh, as well as a, a link to the, the Peace Channel online. So I'm glad we're bringing in these, these questions of self-care. And so we have another speaker um, who's gonna address the topic similarly, Gloria Maria Abaca Obregón from Mexico. 
Uh, she is a professor, a consultant, a workshop leader on peace education in Mexico, Paraguay, Colombia, Spain, Morocco. Her principal area of work and research is in peace education with a focus on holistic peace. Gloria. And thank you, Tony, for this invitation and for this space. Um, I want to uh, continue with the idea that uh, 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 it was developing about uh, caring and how we can really care about the healing, the healing mental process that we are going to have in this moment. Um, I'm going to include two, two topics, uh, the introduction of ethic of caring and one methodology that maybe we can develop. Um, it's important in peace education now open this ethic of caring, like an open space to practice, take care first ourselves, uh, not only the body, but even the other dimensions, like our body, emotions, uh, mental process, spirituality, and how this caring is going to develop uh, the idea of caring the others and even the, the life. Um, how this moment is important to understand that self-care is not only one uh, part. It's important to have a self-care community because sometimes to care only ourselves is not enough to have the tools to, uh, to be in a crisis or to be in this challenge on even this um, pandemic moment is going to develop different kind of violence. And we know that the violence is uh, the answer. And if we don't want uh, the, the answer be violence, we have to give tools that the peace can be the, the answer with a different kind of a tool of transformation and open other kind of spaces. That's the reason that I want to speak about the circle of peace, like a methodology. We can do it even now. Uh, we can make virtual circle of peace. I start to do it with uh, students of uh, the master, even with uh, friends and peace worker, that we can have this community that we can develop, uh, starting now defense option and transformation that we can develop. Circle of peace, we have different theories like a Cape Pranis, and it's so easy to start to open these peace circles. It's coming from the a healing wheel that include the four aspects of the human beings, like uh, the body, like uh, the emotional aspect, the mental aspects, and the life or the spiritual aspect. That we can know that it's important to speak about this. Uh, the circular space is like a space, a space that we can show our vulner vulnerability means like the human beings, we are so vulnerable, like compassion sets, like it's important to know that we are uh, with feelings like fear, uh, uncertain, like a, um, maybe sometimes we don't know what happened there. And it's important, this topic is inside of the families, in the communities, and we speak about it. And maybe Peace Circle is like a, the space that we can speak about it, and we can start to develop tools, and even we can start to develop a network a net that we can uh, start to go beyond to this and to start to know how we can uh, start to make this uh, humanization that we listened before at the same time how we can make solid solidarity and how we can develop this idea how we are connected but in the reality there are so many proposals for example that people that who need food and they put tables and people who can leave food and who can take the food. And at the same time, we can make defense connections and even the uh, peace circles can give you a different idea. And in this web webinar, we, it's important that we know how different countries start to make different actions and how we can uh, support each other. Um, for me, it's important to have connection uh, with another people because they can give me another uh, perspective and even we can start to build like a family peace or peace families. Uh, we start like a Facebook page that uh, peace families that we can add activities and even videos that we can uh, include how in different countries or in different cities they start to help each other and how solidarity start to grow up. Uh, that's the reason that for me, 
I know that uh, the fear gives you sometimes like a, a, the idea that we don't have to do nothing or freeze yourself. And that's the reason that uh, for me, self uh, caring community is going to give you more like the idea to move, to have hope, to have an ideas, to share, even to say, I don't know, even to show you vulnerability, that we're in this fear because it's normal, it's something that we don't know. And actually, we don't know how long it's going to be. That's the reason that it's important until now to start to go into this uh, period to those and know, but to start to build together something like a self-caring uh, ideas, like in a community. And thank you for this space, Tony. And hi, everybody. <laughs> thank you, uh, Gloria. Marvelous to see you here. Thanks for keeping to exactly five minutes. And thank you for introducing the ethic of care um, as something really integral to our work in peace education. And it's not just care of self, but care of others, care of life in general. Um, and I think this idea of self-care communities is probably what drew a lot of us here today to this webinar. We're here for that purpose. So I now uh, want to continue our, our tour of, um, of the, the region of the world and by inviting our dear friend Amada Benavides from Colombia, who's going to give us um, shifting a little bit from self-care to a, a more challenging topic, um, addressing um, pandemics, social conflict, and armed conflict. Um, and so Amada has been someone we've been working for for a very long time. Uh, since 2003, she has been the president of the Peace uh, Schools uh, Foundation uh, based in Bogota, Colombia. And since 2011, she's been fully dedicated to promoting cultures of peace through peace education. And she is now working in particular in post-conflict territories occupied by the FARC, supporting teachers and youth uh, with the implementation of peace agreements through peace education. Amada. Thank you, Tony, and thank you for uh, uh, having this good idea. Hello, everybody around the world. I want to start with a, a poem wrote by Juan uh, last September 21, 2019. For peace, welcome. For children, freedom. For the mother's life to live in, in tranquility. Together with other youths, he participated in our program. They sang songs and wrote messages alluding to this day, with hope as a banner, being inhabitants of territory where former FARC had its headquarters and today are peace territories. However, on April 4, new actors in the war blended the life of this young man, his father, a peasant union leader, and another of his brother. All this in the midst of the curfew imposed by government as a measure to control COVID-19 pandemic. This first person example shows the multiple threats that occurred in countries with Latin armed and social conflicts, such as the case of Colombia. Those, it, there are those of, for whom, sadly, stay home is not an option. It's not an option for many families, many communities due to the recurrence of armed conflict and violence, where words of the gold, Goldman Prize Award, Francia Marquez. For her and other leaders, an eventual arrival of COVID-19 cases worsened the anxiety that these communities are experiencing due to, ar due to armed confrontations. According to Leiner Palacios, a leader living in Chocó, in addition to COVID-19, they must deal with the pandemic of not having aqueducts, medicines, or medical personnel to attend to us. The epidemic and control measures to prevent its spread have affected differently upper and upper middle urban class contexts, grid urban mass living in an informal economy, and deep rural Colombia. More than 13 million people live in Colombia in the informal economy, looking every day to find little money to subsist. This group includes people who depend on informal sales, micro and small entrepreneurs, women with precarious jobs and historically excluded groups. They have not complied with the restriction imposes because for this population, the dilemma is in their own words, die from the virus or stay. Between March 25 and 31, there were at least 22 different mobilizations. 54% of which occurring in capital cities and 46% in other municipalities. They asked government for support measures with although they have been granted are insufficient 
since they are measures carried out from paternalistic visions and are not supportive or attend to comprehensive reforms. This population is forced to break the isolation restriction, creating imminent risk for their lives and their communities. Coupled with that, in this moment, connection between informal economy and illegal economy will grow and increase social conflict. In relation to rural Colombia, as Ramon Iriarte point, the other Colombia is a country in perpetual quarantine. People flee and hide because they know that here threats are facing. During last week on March, there are signs of dynamic that could occur during this pandemic. Aggression and killings, and killings of social leaders, new events on forced displacement and confinement, renewable flow or, of international migrants and, good, and goods due to the illegal trace, riots and protests in some cities, increase of, in forest fires in regions such as Amazon, and the, op and the opposition of some populations to forced eradication of illicit crops. In other hand, Venezuelan migration content today in more than 1,800,000 people who live in very precarious conditions without access to food, housing, health, and decent work. It is important to consider what the effects may be in the border area closest as part of measures to respond to, to virus. There, government humanitarian assistance is limited and much of, much of the response is provided by international cooperation which has notified the temporary suspension of its, of its activities. According to Fundación Ideas para la Paz, COVID-19 will have an impact on armed conflict dynamics and on the implementation of on peace agreements, but its effects will be differentiated and not necessarily negative. For example, the last ELNs and in pronouncement of a, of a unilateral ceasefire and government new appointment of peace managers are news that bring some hope. Finally, isolation also implies intrafamiliar violence increase, especially against women and girls. Coexistence in the small spaces grows the level of conflict and aggression against weakest. This may be evident in many settings, but this has a greater impact in armed conflict areas. So the question is, is, what are the actions that must be addressed in this crisis moment, both at the government and level, international community, civil society as a personal dynamics? One of, one of the important pandemic consequences is the recovery of public sense and state obligations on integral guarantee of human rights and human dignity. This includes the need to regulate between others employment conditions in new di digital age. The question in these scenarios is how fragile state can resume public policy direction, direction when their capacity is limited even in normal situations. But giving, greater, but giving greater state power and control can also give way to adoption of repressive, coercive and authoritarian measures such as what has happened in countries where extreme repressive decrees imposing an army curfew and threats to enforce measures with army support, subjugating bodies and controlling population from biopower where premises which we call ¿Cómo le ha ido, mamo? ¿Qué me cuenta? ¿Cómo están ustedes? in last century. An intermediate alternative has emerged from local governments. From Bogotá to New York and Medellín, they have given more timely and effective responses to population, in, con in contrast, homogeneous and cool ones taken from national entities. Strengthening this operation and the capacities from local functionaries and level is important with respective connections with national and transnational actions, work locally to impact globally. From peace education, it's an opportunity to delve into issues and values that have been flags for, of our movement, reinforce ethics of care, which implies attention to ourselves, to other human beings, other living beings in the, in the environment. Strengthening the requirement of comprehensive protection of rights, advancing the commitment to eliminate patriarchy and militarism, rethink new economic ways to reduce consumption and protect nature, handle conflict in nonviolent ways to, adopt, to avoid increasing intrafamily abuses in times of confinement and at, and at all times. There are many challenges, many opportunities for permit one, and other young people with whom we were to say, 
for life, for life the air, for the air the heart, for the heart Lord, for love illusion. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, Amada. Um, thank you for sharing with us the, the real challenges uh, the COVID is presenting, particularly in fragile states, um, how the vulnerabilities of historically marginalized and excluded groups are even more, made more precarious in these particular moments and the differentiated impacts that we need to be thinking about and how we can address those through peace education. I want to continue uh, with a, another colleague who's been working in, in uh, Colombia, but hails from Argentina, Alicia Cabezudo. Um, she teaches um, at Latin American universities uh, and throughout uh, the region, Colombia, Brazil, Argentina, Uruguay, Chile, Mexico, Puerto Rico, Costa Rica, and on and on. Um, she has been working closely with Amada and the Schools for Peace Foundation on the peace agreements um, and uh, through uh, Colombian Peace Universities Network. Alicia. Actually, it's quite similar in a way. They're similar everywhere. Que cualquiera que hayamos conocido antes, Mapo. More similar than the others. But uh, my talk is not going to be a kind of lecture. It's going to be a kind of talk and questioning on our role as peace educators or the role of peace education in this present situation. And first of all, I was asked Latin American in general. Está todo, estamos todos aquí guardados porque siempre... May I continue? Yeah, I'm sorry. Someone keeps unmuting themselves. I'm going to um, uh, okay. kick them out of the meeting if they keep doing that. All right. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. So first of all, uh, I want to, to share with you the idea that uh, when this pandemic comes, then the first thing to think is, well, another crisis. So for Latin American continent, this, this another one is like we are with wars, with poverty, with misery, with bad governments, with a non, how can I say, successful democracies, and now this. So the first thinking was, uh, well, uh, what are we going to do? And from our point of view, from uh, educators' point of view, what can we do? So how can we manage? We always say that peace education is transformative, that peace education helps people, peace education would help communities or nations or whatever. Now, this is the moment, what are we going to do? But the first thing that I have uh, want to highlight is that for uh, I'm a Latin America, peace education is an exercise of reflection and action. So following the great Paulo Freire, then what we have to do. Como comunidad, no pueden dejar right. la entrada de nadie que venga de fuera y me... Is to reflect on the reality and to think what can we do with this reality that happens now. And in this reality then we can uh, assure that we have uh, quite a good experience about pandemia because we have not only in the world and in our continent the pandemic of the CV-19, but we have the pandemic of war, we have the pandemic of poverty, we have the pandemic of misery, we have the pandemic of inequality, we have the pandemic of non-dialogue and non-understanding with the government and even between themselves, ourselves. So it's not a new situation and sometimes I feel a little bit uncomfortable when all the global level we are thinking and talking about pandemias as it's a new global thing which I really think that war is quite global, the poverty is quite global, the misery is quite global, and the inequality, and that's our pandemias as well. So the first reflection that we have to do mainly with our peoples in communities, as Gloria had said, 
in schools, in formal and informal education, is about thinking that this situation comes from the structures. So according with the Gardner, of course, and these structures create this kind of pandemias. And this is the last one, or perhaps it's one of them, but uh, we have to be prepared for more than the CD19. That, that's what I want to highlight. The second thing is that we have to think from the political vision of the CB19. So we have to think about what political structures have allowed that this happened. And mainly our friends from Africa and also from Philippines mainly, and also China in New York had pointed out the issue of the importance of governments, how they deal with this pandemic, how are they a response, because uh, on that reflection, it's easy to understand uh, what happened after, mm, the case of the United States, or the case of some countries that started, uh, how can I say, late, and I don't want to think about Brazil so late, and what is happening. So the relationship in between the responsibility with the community and the governmental responsibility, and how they take care of business, or money, or health, or people. So this is a big deal in peace education, to make uh, people think, our students, our neighbors, our educators, our colleagues, about uh, the real implication that um, a world pandemic comes with and that have to be resolved by all. It is true that we have to resolve with the community. It is true that we have to resolve with our own societies, but it is a world thought that we have to change. So from that point of view, the pandemic, the CV-19, is a challenge. It is a local challenge, but it is a global challenge, but a challenge not only for the health ministry. It is a challenge for the governmental ministries. It's a challenge for our thoughts in order to think what we want, what we need, what we deserve, and what we have to ask to the governments. So this crisis is another crisis. This is the last one, I'm not sure this is not going to be the last one, but we have to point it out, the, the, the great responsibility that the governments have in order to put money in weapons, to put money in war, to put money in killing a mother and not in life. So this is the moment to think, as all my colleagues have said, to oblige our government to think in life and not in money and not in mother. And also to create peace structures, ministries of, of peace, departments of peace, offices of peace, because we have war and army structures. Let's think that the movement is in order to create all this. So, what is my, my invitation to all of you? My invitation is to make the vision exercise, coming from dear old Elise Bowling, that it is to study the actual situation, to detail what is happening, to take the, the worst of the actual situation and try to make it diminish or disappear, and to take the best and to make it to make better and better. So our vision exercise is to ambition a new structure in the societies, a new structure in the political thoughts, a new structure in all of us. That is the challenge of peace education nowadays. Thank you. Marvelous, Alicia. Thank you so much for um, reminding us that this uh, is a not uh, this pandemia is while well, it's unique, uh, we are experiencing these other pandemias: uh, war, uh, poverty, inequality, lack of dialogue. These are really important things for us to think about. 
And more than anything, I think uh, I really want to thank you for bringing in this important futures envisioning perspective. It's not enough for us to just critique the, fal the failings of the systems, but to begin to imagine and envision new political structures, new social structures, and new economic structures. We have um, one more speaker. Unfortunately, he's been having a little bit of difficulty connecting, uh, but he has shared a video with me that I'm going to share with you. And that is our colleague, Kevin Kester, um, who is in South Korea, but a US citizen. And uh, Kevin is a, a tenure track assistant professor of international education and global affairs at the College of Education in the Graduate School of Education uh, at Kim Yong University in Daegu, South Korea. Um, he's been doing work in peace education for a long time. And let me go ahead and share his short video here with you. Hello, everyone. My name is Kevin Hello, Kester. Kevin. I'm going to join with a pre-recorded video because I'm having difficulty getting on Zoom right now. And I'm speaking to you from Daegu, South Korea, the epicenter of the outbreak of COVID-19 in South Korea. Are we living in a post-truth era? What elements constitute this? And how has this impacted upon the initial denial, inaction, and eventual bewildering and deadly response to the pandemic, particularly in Western democracies? Michael Peters contends that the contemporary era post-2016 has ushered in the end of globalization and a return to state isolationism or hypernationalism. This is evident in such state policies as America First and Brexit, but he also argues that it is a chilling realization that Trump's election to power and Brexit are both in part reputedly a series of a, a result of a series of information interventions and in the internal democratic political processes of the US and Britain. He continues, open quote, information is the new warfare both against civil society and other countries, close quote. Now, I agree with much of what Peters is arguing here, but I would also point out importantly that we are doing this to ourselves. The big bad wolf is not out there. It's not Russia. It's not China. It is in our homes, our schools, our communities, our churches, and our social media groups. It is easy to blame China for the virus, or to blame Russia for meddling with the 2016 U.S. presidential elections. And while there might be some culpability, it is not a scapegoat for our own responsibility. So it is much more difficult to turn the gaze back on ourselves and take personal and national responsibility for this crisis. Russia and China did not dismantle the National Security Council's Infectious Diseases Unit. Russia and China did not use the media to sow denial and a sense of naive optimism across the United States. Russia and China did not take the UK political pulpit in mid-March to promote herd immunity and to say to families that they should be prepared to lose many of their loved ones before their time. Now, that's a, that's a quotation from Boris Johnson. Russia and China did not force the UK to take a laissez-faire economic approach to a public health disaster. Western neoliberalism did. And Russia and China are not dangerously touting medical, magical medical pills to people on the US on the nightly news. Our elected leaders are. This is what constitutes our post-truth moment. Our democratic processes got us to this point. Our monetization of what matters is what got us here. Our modern hubris and our denial of science. In other words, it's post-truth decay. And this is evident by two points. First, the promotion of belief and feelings on par with or in lieu of expertise. And second, the political manipulation of the aforementioned individuated truth allows certain actors to promote their own agendas cloaked in the notion that such truth is unknown because it has been suppressed. This is a this is a call to the underdog. Sonia Stokes, a fellow at Johns Hopkins, recently summed it all up. She says, we have reached a critical juncture where free speech and free markets are colliding with public health and safety at a perilous rate 
on social media. So how are we to respond as educators? One response is political, and this response is desperately needed today. We must address the defunding of our public health systems and of our education systems. The siphoning of funds from these very important social services toward war and a culture of war is a conversation that we need to have amongst ourselves, but also with our students and in our scholarly journals. The calls to not discuss politics in these difficult times is also deeply problematic. This crisis is political, not the virus, but the response to it. Science and public health are political activities. The second approach is more pragmatic. We need to teach students critical thinking. We need to teach them philosophical thinking, and we need to teach them some basic research consumption, such as the triangulation of sources. To do this, we could have students read, read, read again and again. We should have them triangulate sources. We could have them seek new evidence. And in the void of evidence, we should have students theorize, test their ideas, adapt those ideas, and then repeat. So these are my very brief educational responses. Teach, and for the educators, relearn every day the process of critical thinking. Teach philosophical thinking, triangulate sources, and acknowledge the politics of social activity, including science. And in the end, I hope that this crisis will expose the post-truth decay for what it is and lead us once again to trust in our public institutions. Thank you again from Daegu. Have a good night. Wonderful. Thank you, Kevin. I hope you're able to watch us via Facebook. Um, I really, really, truly appreciate this perspective on post-truth decay, the challenge of information as a form of new warfare, and the need to sort of, using a metaphor here, inoculate ourselves through peace education uh, by nurturing critical thought and thinking in our students, uh, amongst other things. So I know we're, we're actually quite well over time, um, but I, I do want to open it up for a couple of, of responses. And um, I've, I'm hoping um, I see our, our dear colleague, um, Betty Reardon, is here with us on Zoom. And uh, I'd like to give her an opportunity to provide a, a short response if she's still available. Betty, would you like to offer a response? Uh, oh, I see you pushed my button. Yes. OK. And you pushed just the right one. <laughs> so I am an invisible voice from a very distant past catapulted into this marvelous future. Uh, it is like a scenario we used to do in the 1960s when I first began peace education and we talked about futures, utopian, dystopian, and everything in between. And one of them was communication in just this fashion. But this whole thing has been a real revelation to me. It's kind of like uh, a technique dentists used to use to find where all the hidden cavities were that they didn't get on x-ray. It was called a disclosure capsule and you put it in your mouth and it colored up all the bad parts. And I think of this virus as a disclosure capsule. It's uncovering all the bad parts most of us have, have seen bits and pieces of, from our, our own perspectives, where we are in the world or where we are in our lives, or the other things that determine how we look at the world and what we see as problems. But now we at last have, as uh, we recognize an opportunity to see our problems as humanity. That's part of the disclosure. And one of the main things it's disclosing is not, all, not only the structures which are so evident here in New York, now in the center of what Janet had pointed out, but where we ourselves are. Lockdown is another metaphor 
Social separation is another metaphor for what the patriarchal nation state system has been doing to us for generations. And so the question I have for all of us is, how do we liberate ourselves from that lockdown? One of the starting points I'd like to suggest, and I will leave it with that, is what I call connecting the dots. Each of you has made very important points. Many of these points converge. If we are going to have the kind of analysis of the problem that we really need, we're going to have to make those connections. So I would ask each of you to review all of the wonderful ideas that have been put forward this morning. See how your ideas connect with those of one other or two others of your colleagues in a specific way that we can tra transform into the kind of pedagogy that Kevin and Alicia and others were suggesting, but something that is a new pedagogy, a new ped pedagogy which will be our disclosure capsule. So thank you very much for all that you are doing, all that you will do. Thank you, Andrew. <laughs> Wonderful to hear and listen to Betty. I'm so glad to hear, to listen to her. It's wonderful to see you. <laughs> so just just given the fact that I mean, we're, we're well, we're 20 minutes over time already, and actually I, I need to shut down in the next 10 minutes because of a, a future commitment I have myself, uh, I, maybe I just want to open it up really quickly to um, our speakers. If you have any quick comments, responses, thoughts, reflections you would like to share, similar to what Betty has just proposed for us, the need for thinking about these new pedagogies, about how we connect the dots. Uh, and before I do so, I, I do really want to make um, this invitation very clear and serious. And we would love, especially amongst the speakers who have shared with us today, to be able to post what you have offered in article form. Um, and thinking pedagogically, um, I would like to, to find a way that we can um, explore how we can, what we put online become, can, can, uh, become a little bit more dialogical so we can be um, responding to our peers, learning from our peers uh, in a more transformative way. So uh, will any of our speakers would like, uh, like to share any, any kind of last thoughts or words really briefly? Uh, today, I think I'll just respond uh, just briefly to a comment from um, from Jacob, you know, talking about the issue of human rights. I'll just talk, talk about uh, one or two minutes you know, about it. Yes, you know, when we look at the situation in Nigeria and most African countries within this COVID period, we notice the brutality from the armed forces and the military and the police. Most, you know, against poor people who have been brutalized because they are not enforcing, uh, you know, adhering to the to lockdown. So the question is, what do we do in this situation of people who are already in poverty who need to go out to eat? My suggestion is that we need to start looking at a world where we're breaking down the barriers. Just like I pointed out earlier, we need to start looking at a level world, not what we envisaged earlier, because, you know, the poor and the rich are not feeling the impact of COVID-19 equally, no. The rich are able to stock food, but the poor need to go out every day to get their food. So how do we start a solidarity movement? How do those who have are able to give to those who don't have? It's enough to say, sit down at home. You don't need to go out so that you don't spread the virus. But a man who does not, who does not have food might most likely die at home from hunger. And the rich folk who is asking him, stay at home, has food. So we need to start thinking, how do we build a solidarity where those who have are able to mitigate the effort on those who don't have? That is a global solidarity we need to start thinking about. It's not enough mm -hmm. to ask people to sit at home. Those who sit okay. at home okay. and have okay. no food are going to die from hunger. So we need to start looking mm -hmm. at that. Thank you. I think uh, Collins is right. Uh, this is really also my concern 
so that I believe uh, that this uh, situation uh, creates uh, even more inequality in the world than before. The rich countries, they will manage it in some way and they are maybe doing well uh, when it comes to their own population. But they forgot about the rest of the world and they do not see that what concerns the poorest ones in the world concerns all of us. But I believe that when uh, Betty spoke about a lockdown as a metaphor, maybe the lockdown could be an eye opener. And this is what we as peace educators should do to transform the lockdown and the social separation in a social uh, solidarity and to make our people understand not to think only on themselves because we do not really suffer so much in Europe. Not really. But other parts of the world are really much more concerned. So, and I believe it's our duty to make people understand that solidarity up from now is global solidarity. Thank you. Thank you, Werner. Anyone else from our speaker group like to share a quick, quick response or comment? Maybe uh, we can have some kind of, you said dialogue group, Tony. Is there some way to follow up or Betty suggested in uh, finding convergences and making small groups of people to dialogue so we could have a kind of Zoom meetings of 10 or under so there's more uh, development of ideas. Yeah, no, I think that's a wonderful idea and that's something uh, the global campaign can look uh, to support and, and try to organize. Obviously, um, as pedagogical forum, this webinar with 265 people or so at its peak, it's not uh, typically ideal for the kinds of dialogical um, approaches that we prefer in peace education. So we can definitely, we can definitely put that forward. Um, and I, I think uh, we're all certainly inspired um, by today's conversation that without a doubt, whatever we do in the future, we'll start um, uh, producing some more of these interactive spaces um, and opportunities to share the voice and wisdom of, of these educators from around the world. Um, so, uh, uh, yes, who is that? If I may, it's Bernadette uh, from sure. South Africa. A quick comment is just about the issue about inequality. And when we speak about inequality, most people mean rich and poor. Yes, the poor are the majority. And there's a joke going about that if we get really, really hungry, the poor will just eat the rich. But that joke aside, which isn't really funny, uh, given the, the crisis of real hunger and poverty that we have, um, I wanted to remind us that within inequality, there is inequality and that without having a broader lens, uh, intersectional lens on inequality, looking at other inequities, including gender inequity, including the exploitation of the rapacious exploitation of the environment around the world, which has led to this crisis, uh, things that Betty Reardon and other brilliant uh, people who've taught us have, have written about and spoken about for decades. Without taking a more sophisticated lens on inequality, um, um, you know, our, our, we, we aren't going to touch sides and we're just going to replicate uh, the inequality, uh, that inequalities that we're trying to, to uh, transform in a nonviolent way. Mm, brilliant, and I think I'd like to, to close on that. Thank you very much, Bernadette, for reminding us of the importance of this intersectionality. Uh, lens we have to bring to understanding inequity. So we will, um, as, as mentioned before, um, we will have a recording of this available for you to share, view, um, and enjoy and learn from uh, post on our website, hopefully in a day or two. Um, and please, if you have yet to have a chance, uh, consider joining the Global Campaign for Peace Education. Um, it's, it's a great way for us to stay in touch, be part of a global community, practicing uh, these forms of prefigurative politics, um, and um, learning with and from each other that's so important to our ability to uh, enact the future changes that Betty implored us to explore. So thank you all again for this really wonderful, um, exciting webinar. Thanks for your enthusiasm. Thanks for your solidarity. Thanks for um, 
nurturing this ethic of self-care um, for self and community that's so important for sustaining our efforts to the future. We will see you soon. <laughs>